Our speaker tonight is Signe Danler, um, who will tell us about designing a sustainable garden, uh, a beginner's guide. And um, Signe is a longtime gardener and plant nerd. And she puts her experience in training in horticulture, uh, ecological landscaping and urban forestry to good use teaching the online master gardener and home horticulture classes. As a landscape designer, she designs both residential and commercial landscapes, specializing in regenerative gardening and landscape practices. So I think without further ado, I will turn it over to Signe. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Okay, let's see if I can share my screen. And while I'm working on that bit, um, I just want to say, uh, seeing your, your various questions in the chat, um, since this is uh, a landscape design, uh, I'll find the right thing here. Since this is a landscape design um, lecture, I probably won't be answering questions on pests. Whoops, why is that doing that? Hmm. I hope, hope I'm not gonna have problems with this being on a Mac. If I do, I'll have to switch to a different computer. Anyway, um, can you see my screen? Should say sustainable landscape design. Yes, I can. Okay, good. And, and just, you're seeing the right part, just what you're supposed to see there? I think so, yeah. Okay, good. Then everything's set up right. Hopefully it'll go all right. Okay, well, um, let me just get started here. So we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, what I typically start this class with is a quote that's very meaningful to me. The front lines of the battle for nature are not in the Amazon rainforest or the Alaska wilderness. The front lines are our backyards, medians, parking lots, and elementary schools. The ecological warriors of the future will be anyone who can influence a small patch of land. That's from a, a very good book, uh, Planting in a Post-Wild World by Thomas Rainier and Claudia West, which I highly recommend. And we are all those people who have small patches of land that we can influence, hopefully more sustainably. Uh, just a second, I've got to adjust a couple of things here. Okay, so any design project needs targets and goals. In order to design a sustainable landscape or a garden, first you need to know what you want it to do. So before we get to the design part, we'll talk a little about what a sustainable garden or landscape can do. A sustainable garden to one degree or another doesn't need a lot of inputs of water, pesticides, or fertilizers, and of course, your time for maintenance. A sustainable garden can actually conserve rather than waste water, soil, and even the wildlife that can inhabit it. It can even improve the environment by stabilizing and enriching soil, taking carbon from the atmosphere and sequestering it in the soil, and much more. But since this is a garden we're talking about, not a wild landscape, it must also meet human needs, your needs. Research and common sense show that humans need contact with nature to be at our healthiest. The best gardens provide that right outside your door. Of course, one can go too far. This landscape doesn't require much in the way of inputs, but it doesn't do much for the ecosystem or for human needs either. So a sustainable landscape is diverse and densely planted, not a monoculture. It's adaptable and it changes regularly instead of being static and unchanging as people often try to keep landscapes. It's adapted to natural water cycles, which is particularly important in a place like Western Oregon or Eastern Oregon for that matter, uh, rather than being a water thirsty landscape. It's a partnership between humans and nature rather than totally human controlled. It can provide shelter, food, and water for wildlife, as opposed to providing very few benefits for wildlife. It can persist without too much human maintenance instead of failing without constant maintenance. And ideally it would have minimal inputs and those organic when they're needed rather than a lot of chemical inputs. Now I mentioned dense planting. By the way, I want to apologize for some of the um, uh, uh, titles here. When I switched computers, um, the, the fonts went all wonky and I didn't have time to fix it. So hopefully that won't be too much of a problem. Um, I mentioned dense planting. One way of looking at this is to realize that the plants that inhabit our gardens are communities. 
and the more closely they imitate nature, the more successful they're likely to be. In nature, plants grow in densely layered communities, starting with ground covers and perennials, through small and large shrubs to understory and overstory trees, and perhaps vines knitting it together. These closely interrelated communities of plants exploit every level and every niche, both above and below ground, efficiently utilizing all available resources. All too often, people tend to skip one or more layers. They may plant just trees in a lawn or shrubs with nothing growing underneath them, like that. This is an invitation to weeds, which strive to fill the vacuum. Remember that saying, nature abhors a vacuum. So while we may believe intuitively that a diverse, densely planted landscape is more sustainable than a conventionally maintained lawn, there's actually research to back this up. In this study from 2004, two similar residential yards were compared. One had a conventional front yard of lawn, a few exotic shrubs, and an irrigation system to keep it green. The other was landscaped with drought-tolerant native plants, a water infiltration pit, and a drip irrigation system. Which do you think looks better? Both are attractive yards that would have their advocates, but let's put it in monetary and labor terms. Which do you think would take more of your time and money to maintain? As you might have guessed, the sustainable yard required much less water in one year, 83% less. It sent 56% less waste to the landfill over a year. It needed 68% less labor to maintain. Um, with the result that it cost $2,200 per year less, and that's in 2004 dollars. Does that have any effect on your perception of which yard is more appealing? For a lot of people, it does. Here's a local example of a very sustainable landscape that's very beautiful as well and low maintenance. It's in the parking lot of the Oregon Garden, where they don't have the funding or staffing to maintain elaborate landscapes for a car's park. This is a densely planted area with ground covers and perennials through small and large shrubs to understory and overstory trees, filling up all the layers. This density helps to crowd out weeds. A knowledgeably chosen selection of plants minimizes any need for pruning, deadheading, staking, and other common garden chores. Note too that large rocks provide structure even in winter and also hold moisture in the soil for plants to utilize. So a little bit about that soil. Healthy, biologically active soil is the first requirement for a sustainable garden. A primary characteristic of a healthy soil is that it has plenty of organic matter. This helps it retain moisture as well as nutrients, which it releases slowly for plants to use. Organic matter in the soil also stores carbon that has been pulled from the atmosphere by plants and buffers sudden pH changes that could be harmful to plants. Most importantly, it's full of life. The billions of active organisms and even a teaspoon of soil make all of this happen as they eat and excrete, live and die in the soil beneath your feet. When you have healthy soil, it grows healthy plants, which are much better able to withstand environmental stresses like pests, disease, and extreme weather. Briefly, the things you can do to improve and maintain soil health are pretty simple. Keep the soil covered. Mulch is fine. Living plants are even better. Don't compact the soil. All those little soil critters have worked hard to build up the tilth and create a balance of soil, air, and water. Use stepping stones or paths to show where to walk, and as much as possible, keep feet and equipment off of everywhere else. Don't disturb the soil any more than you have to. Tilling totally destroys soil tilth, and even constantly digging and replanting takes roots out of the soil. If roots are left in the soil, they improve it. Don't let rain wash your soil away. Again, a dense plant and root cover holds soil in place and mulch can help too. Get your soil tested. If it shows that your soil is deficient in any nutrients, you can add organic amendments, but don't overdo it. For the most part, an ecosystem of healthy soil and plants has everything it needs. And then there's also reducing water use. These are steps you can take to conserve the water that falls naturally on your site and to minimize the need for supplemental water. Keep water from leaving the site. 
encourage it to infiltrate into the soil and groundwater with rain gardens, berms, or pervious pavers. Choose plants carefully to match their water needs with what the site can supply. Mulch and dense plantings conserve water in addition to benefiting the soil. When you do need to irrigate, use water-wise methods like drip irrigation and water deeply but infrequently. More on that. Um, the timing of irrigation has a lot to do with how effective it is. If you apply the water very deeply, but infrequently rather than shallow and often, it will encourage plant roots to grow more deeply into the soil. You see in the illustration how if the top of the soil has dried out somewhat, the roots will go down more deeply to get the soil moisture that's further down. This makes them more resilient to drought, drought stress, and it's especially important for larger plants like shrubs and trees. Even a lawn, though, will grow deeper roots if you um, water it a little less frequently, but more deeply. Now, watering zones are a really important concept. This is grouping plants by their water needs. This is redu also reduces water use, and it makes for more healthy plants. Since this is part of designing a garden, we'll cover it more in the design section. You may be starting to get the idea that this is all interconnected, and you would be right. Soil organisms that thrive in a healthy soil can be decimated by the application of pesticides and even herbicides. Non-selective pesticides in particular kill a wide range of organisms, including the majority that are beneficial. You can reduce and even eliminate the need for pesticides by growing a healthy ecosystem, both plants and soil. Don't overfeed or overwater the plants. Lush high nitrogen leaves are very attractive to pest insects. If you have plants that are pest or disease magnets, why not consider growing something else that's more resistant rather than spraying for them? And as for weeds that you might want to spray out of, uh, out of existence, just remember, weed is a human concept. It's simply a plant growing where humans don't want it. The exception, of course, being truly invasive plants. Sometimes these can only be controlled by the careful use of herbicides. Now, finally, um, a healthy, sustainable ecosystem will include various fauna in addition to plants and the soil organisms. A diversity of trees, shrubs, and perennials of all sorts provide shelter, food, and nesting sites for insects and other creatures. Native plants in particular host native butterfly larvae and other insects. And if you can avoid being too tidy, messy areas provide nesting, hiding, and hibernating places for beneficial insects. So that was a very quick survey of gardening methods that will promote and increase the sustainability of your landscape. But what about you? What about the humans that will use your yard and garden? That's where design comes into it. Design is where human needs meet nature's needs and laws and hopefully find a happy accommodation. One of the first steps to creating a design for your site is knowing what outside forces influence it, but are mostly outside of your control. The site inventory, as it's called, should include the hardiness zone you live in and the associated microclimates that you might have. It should include how much sun various parts of your property get, where wind blows and water flows, what sort of ecosystem, natural or not, surrounds it, and what kind of soil underlies it. These are all things that you can't have much influence on, but they have a big influence on your garden. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the USDA hardiness zones, which will affect the entire area you live in. Historically, our part of the Willamette Valley has been mostly zone 8B. Um, hmm. I was going to zoom in on that, but my screen doesn't seem to have a zoom, so I guess I won't. Um, anyway, we've historically been a zone 8B. This means the winter lows are rarely less than 15 to 20 degrees. That's in our area. Now, I understand some of you may be from on the other side of the mountains. Obviously, this doesn't apply to you. You are in much colder zones. But regardless, um, there's always exceptions to what the, the um, average temperatures are, like the winter of 2013-14, when in Western Oregon, the lows were in single digits. This was a full zone or two colder than normal. 
More to the point though, climate change is causing those average winter lows to rise wherever you are. This could mean lows rarely below 20, but it also means hotter, drier summers such as we've had this year. This should strongly influence how we design and live in our gardens. Maybe we'll be able to grow more semi-hardy banana plants, but we'll also have more need of shade and more need to use water wisely. So let's start with the basics. Before you can do any sort of realistic landscape design, you need a base map. It doesn't need to be pretty or elaborate, but it does need to be accurate. If you're going to be basing the placement of walkways, large trees, and other sizable objects on it, you need to take the time to actually measure the spaces you'll be designing. Include buildings, fences, existing trees, and anything else of consequence. Um, a good source for some basic information is Google Maps and also the website of your county assessor's office. You'll usually find some in images and sometimes a measured drawing of buildings that can help uh, get you started without actually having to measure everything on the ground. Now, for your site inventory and sun and shade, um, these change throughout the year and they also change over time. So ideally, if you could observe and keep records of where sun and shade are on your property for about six months, you'll have a good idea of where you have full sun, which is considered to be six hours or more, part shade or full shade. After six months, you get the same pattern in reverse, so you don't necessarily need an entire year of data. You may have full shade on the north side of a house in the summer, um, or in the winter rather, but you may have some sun and perhaps some reflected light in high summer when the sun is um, so far to the north. And of course, over time, if you plant trees, they'll cast more shade as they get bigger. Most old gardens are shady gardens for this reason. Now back to your base map, pay attention to the direction and strength of winds. If cold winter winds blast your house, you might wanna baffle them with a hedgerow. On the other hand, summer breezes can provide welcome cooling for a sitting area. Watch your yard through a rainy season. Where does water come from and drain to? It might sit in one area, it might drain off in another area. Are there areas for where it puddles for days or weeks? And is erosion occurring from that? Now, um, another thing to consider is um, if your site is near existing vegetation or some other sort of natural area, what effect will that have on your garden? A nearby forest may be a welcome neighbor and many of the plants and animals from it may be equally welcome in your garden. You may want to invite them into your garden. But if the forest is full of invasive ivy and blackberries, you probably don't want to welcome them in. And deer may also be very unwelcome. You may need to devise ways to keep them out. And then finally, still on the site inventory, you, the type of soil you'll be gardening on will have a profound effect on the health and resiliency of your garden. You can look up the native soil on the web soil survey online. This will tell you the soil composition in percentages of sand, silt, or clay, and overall characteristics of the soil. However, urban soils have often been heavily modified. They may be compacted or contaminated from construction. Subsoil may have been dug up and dumped on top of topsoil. So it's very important to get your soil tested at least once, so you have a baseline of nutrient and organic matter levels to work from. Now, once you've inventoried the natural setting and how it will influence your site, it's time to think about how you want to use your space. Sketches for this purpose are called functional diagrams. Without getting into too much detail, you use your base map to sketch where usage areas and various functions might go. These can include, but are not limited to, which areas will be publicly visible and which private work areas how people will move from place to place, and views that you might want to enjoy or obscure. In your functional diagram, include existing structures, trees and shrubs and sheds and any outbuildings you might have. Uh, you might include pl existing planting beds that you might want to keep or remove. Indicate where traffic will need to flow the driveway to the front door, uh, the back door to a shed, 
the garage door to a service area. Keep in mind that if a heavily used path makes a sharp right turn, people will naturally cut the corner unless something prevents them. Use your site inventory to tentatively locate other pieces. Do you want a vegetable garden? That sunny spot on the west side of the house might be perfect. Do you avert your eyes from the neighbor's ugly motorhome every time you come up your driveway? Well, a well-placed hedge or fence might be just the thing and make a more pleasing backdrop. Do you want a place for kids or grandkids to frolic and play? Better choose a sunny open spot for a lawn. Do you have a lovely view outside your yard that you want to enjoy? Don't block the view of this borrowed scenery, which is anything outside your yard that you can enjoy from within your yard. Oops. Um, okay, didn't need that. Once you've put all the pieces of your jigsaw puzzle together, often the best layout for your site will be pretty obvious, especially if it's a fairly small site with a lot of different uses in it. Now, once you've established the general usage areas, you can block out different ways to design them. You don't need to be an artist. In this art diagram, which is fairly professionally done, um, a walkway curves through a large lawn to the front door, and the house is surrounded by ample planting beds of shrubs and flowers. Don't be tempted to get any more detailed than this at this stage, like don't get into specific plants. But look at this now. How about this alternative? Less lawn, and the walkway passes through a patio that could hold a sitting area, and it feels nicely enclosed by the borders around it. As you're planning your own site, draw as many of these as you need to until you get one that feels right. You may mix and match many different elements to, to finally reach that point where you have something that you think will work for you. Then you get to work on the details. Always begin with the hardscape. That is walkways, raised beds, outbuildings. These will form the bones of your garden as well as perform functional tasks. So it's important to get them right. In this design, my client wanted a path connecting the driveway to the front door and uh, to the front sidewalk and also going around to the side of the house. Rather than a long straight run of concrete, which is fairly standard, I used a circular motif to connect them all together in a more pleasing way. A raised circular planter also serves as a focal point and somewhat screens the front door from the road. Now, when the time comes for construction of a landscape, whether it's on a new site or one you're making changes to, the hardscape should definitely come first. It's as much less disruptive to your plants to do the hardscape before the plants go in. Now, the next level after the hardscape um, is larger trees and shrubs. These will be substantial long-term residents of the garden. If there are existing plants that you wanna keep, incorporate them into the design too. Pay attention to how the site conditions will affect them and also how they will affect the site over time. Remember that trees cast shade. In this case, this is an existing tree that was being kept, but this is a new one being planted um, in both in places where they wanted an accent or some sh shade. Now, finally, herbaceous plants are the icing on the cake. You can plan them in as much detail as you want, uh, but most likely you'll make a lot of changes along the way. There are the, um, the, the things that will add a lot of color and motion and variety and that you can have a lot of fun playing with, but they don't take up a huge amount of space and they're easy to transplant. Now, there's an often overlooked aspect of landscape design. This is maintenance. It's easy to design and build and plant beautiful scenes, but if it isn't dealt with in the plans, maintenance can become a nightmare. Think about who will be doing it. You, someone you hire, how much energy, time, or money do you have for it? If you design in a way that minimizes maintenance needs, it will be easier on you and your budget, and will also conserve those resources we were talking about earlier. One way is to minimize the use of very high maintenance plants, but you may love some of those like dahlias. If you wanna plant them do, just make sure that you know what you're getting into. Aside from plant choice, there are three big places you can reduce maintenance, lawns, watering zones, and plant size. Sorry, this thing's getting a little slow here. <clears throat> 
Now, lawns have been vilified in recent years. And in fact, a perfect green lawn that requires endless chemicals and water and mowing is not very sustainable. But many people still want at least a small lawn. And there are some functions that lawns seem to perform better than anything else, such as recreation and play space. A lawn can also provide a flat negative space that is restful amid more complicated plantings. And it could be a nice place to walk. Many of a lawn's functions can be performed by other plants. Just don't expect any one of those plants to do everything that turf grass has been bred for years to do. A thyme lawn needs rather relatively little maintenance, plus it blooms pink and smells great when it's stepped on, but you wouldn't want to play soccer on it. Many ground covers are good alternatives in shady areas where grass doesn't grow well. Sun lovers can also grow into a lovely low tapestry that might tolerate a small amount of walking. Lawn mixes with a floral component can be mowed much less frequently and may stay green with much less water than a standard lawn. Those are things like, um, uh, you, oh, fleur de lawn is one of them. Oh, sorry about those titles, geez. Uh, anyway, but if you're going to have a lawn, design it with as much care as any other part of your yard. All too often, lawn is the default that fills any ignored space, which can lead to mowing nightmares like these. Avoid disconnected tiny patches of lawn and sharp corners and objects that must be mowed around. I think of the lawn instead as a shape in and of itself. Simple, large shapes with smooth curves are easy for a mower to navigate. Group trees and shrubs together in lawn-free beds rather than dotted around the turf. Both the trees and the person who mows will be much happier. Now, you may recall I mentioned watering zones earlier. This is a critical concept if you want to control water usage. By planting in zones, you'll minimize overwatering some plants and underwatering others. Zone one is high water use. These zones should be convenient to you and the water source. These will typically be areas you pass by and see frequently and use a lot, such as an entrance, a vegetable garden, or an herb garden. Zone two is moderate water use. These can be more self-sufficient. These might include a shrub border or a rock garden or, excuse me, or a minimally watered lawn. A heavily watered lawn would be a zone one uh, feature. And then finally, there's zone three, which are low water use areas. These might be a hill strip or parking strip um, or a slope planted with uh, native drought tolerant plants. On some properties, this may segue into natural areas outside the property. Once these watering zones are established, stick to them when deciding where to place plants. Don't put a water loving hydrangea next to a drought tolerant ceanothus, no matter how lovely you might think they would look together. Group plants according to their water needs, as well as their sun and shade needs, and they and you will again be much happier. Now, another big mistake people make all the time is not allowing enough room for plants, especially trees and shrubs, uh, for when they reach their mature size. You've surely witnessed these crimes, overgrown foundation plantings that either obscure the house and which you can barely walk by, or they must be whacked back into awkward shapes or even into old wood to keep them from being in the way. If you pay attention to and plan for the mature size of plants, you guessed it, they'll be happier and so will you. And you'll save yourself a lot of unnecessary pruning. Here's a nice example of, a large, of large and medium plants set well away from the house with plenty of room to grow. So to sum up this part, your plants will be healthier and happier, and so will you be happier too, 
If you inventory all your site conditions before starting a garden, plan in advance for your own uses of the site. If you want a lawn, plan the shape for ease of maintenance. Group plants by their water needs in zones from high to low water use and match the mature size of plants to the space they will be in. Now, there's a classic gardener joke. After a trip to the nursery, the gardener is wandering around an already stuffed garden with a plant and a shovel looking for a place to put it. I have to confess, uh, that's exactly what I spent this afternoon doing. I went to Garland a couple of weeks ago and got way too many plants and I spent this afternoon trying to figure out where to plant them. However, this is a do as I say, not as I do. It's not really a good idea. Good design is good design, whether it's seen in a painting, a chair, a house or a garden. Um, it's an excellent way of taming visual chaos. In this final section, we'll touch briefly on just a few fundamental artistic principles that are especially helpful in designing landscapes and gardens. If you've seen a lot of gardens, and if like me, you tend to be a plant collector, I'm sure you'll appreciate this important concept. Good design organizes chaos, which is already there. The design principles I'll cover are line, balance, repetition and contrast, and the use of focal points. Go, go, there we go. So line is the fundamental building block of all design. Lines provide boundaries and structure to both spaces and objects. Line powerfully guides your eyes and your feet to where you should go. Straight lines are very common in human constructed landscapes. They're easier to, to construct with rectilinear materials they provide a sense of order and control. Straight lines are a fundamental structural element for decks, arbors, and buildings. They tend to impart a formal feel to a landscape, especially if they're used symmetrically or repeated, as in the, um, the hedged paths shown here. A straight line can be easily softened by letting plants grow over it in a path. Curved lines tend to be more naturalistic, though not always. Instead of racing along on straight lines, a curved path slows your pace as a curved border slows your eye. But a curved path should have a reason to curve. This one meanders rather pointlessly across the lawn. Add some larger trees and shrubs, and suddenly there's a reason for the meanders. Now, balance and repetition tie the garden together. Formal balance is typically symmetrical as in this herb garden. A balanced view feels restful and right. It's easy for the viewer to comprehend. It doesn't necessarily have to be symmetrical though. Balance can also be asymmetrical and informal. You can balance the mass of a large shrub with the mass of a group of perennials or the airiness of large grasses with the angular thrust of a wooden path. An unbalanced landscape doesn't feel right and it can make a viewer suddenly uneasy. This is a asymmetrically but balanced landscape and then this one is just totally unbalanced. Another key concept is repetition. This helps establish a coherent design. By repeating key plants and shapes or colors, the eye is led through the scene. See how this red foliage repeated in this otherwise green landscape draws your eye into and through the view. In another example, purple and yellow are repeated along this border as are the shrubs that are trained up against the wall. This gives a sense of continuity throughout the border. Not that many of us have a border that big, of course. On a smaller scale, a repeated shape ties two plants together, even though they differ in pretty much every other respect. Ah, those darn titles. Uh, the flip side of repetition is contrast. Contrast of colors, textures, shapes, or patterns. 
foliage is a major player here. Leaves come in many shapes, sizes, and colors, and can be more important than the flowers throughout the year. In this picture, the contrast of size and texture is extreme. Contrast and repetition often show up together in a busy border. How many examples of each can you see here? I'll give you a, just a moment to look at it. There are many right answers. Contrast and repetition. Okay. Now, focal points. A focal point is a single object which draws your eye. It's often a destination, perhaps a place to go sit and enjoy the surroundings as these red chairs uh, draw you to. It can be a bright color or a more subtle scene with a focal point there. Notice how these people serve as a focal point in this particular picture. Now a bright foliage shrub, an obelisk, or an interesting sculpture could provide a somewhat more permanent focal point. In an area without much contrast, uh, such as this spring border that's no longer in bloom, a focal point can be used to bring an otherwise rather boring scene to life. See what happens when a distinctive shape and color is introduced. This is something containers are really good for is just popping in to brighten up a section. Now, some of the more detailed aspects of this include um, shape and form. Uh, plants with distinctive shapes can be the focal point of any planting scheme. In addition to the common mound shapes of many shrubs and perennials, use the outstanding globes of an allium, the tall vase shape of a canna, spires of nephophia or lupin, or spiky yucca. You can play contrasting shapes and textures off each other to increase the excitement of your design, regardless of whether flowers are present. Now, texture is often overlooked, but it can be lovely as a repeated or contrasting element. Textures can be both tactile and visual, and can range from the touchably soft fuzz of stackies or lamb's ears, to the spiky rough of an eryngium, the high gloss of an acanthus leaf, the rough appearance of a rogersia leaf. Trees and shrubs can contribute stunning textures too, as in the craggy peeling bark of uh, um, the Acer grisium, paper bark maple. And then of course there's color. This is probably the first thing most people think of when they're choosing plants all those wonderful flower and foliage colors to choose from. This is such a huge topic that I'll only cover a few of the basics here. You're probably familiar with the color wheel. This is a useful tool for understanding how colors relate to each other. It can help organize and tame what would otherwise be a colorful garden chaos. Complementary colors are opposite each other on the color wheel, red and green, blue and orange, purple and yellow. These contrast the most strongly and create the most eye-popping combinations. Analogous colors are adjacent to each other, blue and purple, red and orange, orange and yellow, and so on. They're related and yet different and tend to create harmonious color schemes. If you choose one single color, say purple, and use several tints and shades of it, you have a monochromatic color scheme. Put these various characteristics together properly and you can suggest different moods and feelings in your garden. Here are some examples of complementary colors in the garden. If the colors are fully saturated, the effect is bright and strong. If the colors are softer, so is the effect. And some examples of analogous or side-by-side -side colors. These can be fiery or restful depending on which colors are featured. Warm analogous colors include red, orange, and sometimes yellow. These evoke the sun and fiery hot themes. 
They appear to advance towards the viewer and add drama and excitement to a garden. They can make a large space feel smaller. Hot colors can be cooled by green and by reducing their intensity. Here, the muted red of the heuchera leaves buffers the hot red and orange primroses. Now, cool analogous colors include blue and purple and also sometimes yellow. These evoke distant mountains, sky and water. They appear to recede from the viewer. They're calming and restful. Notice that yellow can be bright and hot or it can be paler and part of a cool color scheme. Cool colors can make a small space feel larger because they tend to recede. You can play with the intensity and value of colors to create unconventional pairings that still work well. Now, an excellent way of taming the chaos in a garden is to choose a limited color palette for each area. This way, plant placement will be a breeze. You'll always know where to put a new plant you've acquired. At least that's the theory. Shades and tints of the same color create these monochromatic color schemes, but these can be anything but boring. In the garden, green acts as a neutral color because it's so omnipresent. But the infinite shades and shapes and textures of green foliage are a particularly rich source of material and foliage lasts longer than flowers. These color schemes are quite different, although all are based on green. They can be cool and calming or can practically vibrate with energy like the one in the upper right. Another way to use color is the color echo, in which part of one plant picks up the color or a shade of the color from another plant. Here's an interesting combination where the purple barberry foliage is echoed by the tiny purple eyes of a verbascum. And in this one, uh, the pink oxalis brings out the matching pink center and stigma of the otherwise purple geranium. Now, some plants can serve special purposes, such as scrim plants that add height and drama without obscuring the view behind them, like this Verbena bodariensis, which is a very famous scrim plant. Or you can do tall, skinny plants as exclamation points, like these conifers at the Oregon Garden in a otherwise kind of boring shrub landscape. And one more fun concept to play with, light. Morning or evening light can backlight some plants very dramatically. Cast shadows can be equally interesting. Keep these in mind when making choices about plants and their placement. So there was your whirlwind tour through uh, the world of landscape design. Um, obviously there are many, many parts of it that I didn't uh, cover, but hopefully that was a, a, something of an introduction for you. One thing though, is that all of these rules of design are made to be stretched and even broken, except for one. Whatever plants you choose, have some fun with them and enjoy your garden. That's the main point of it. Okay, I'll stop sharing there. Thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. Um, now I will turn it over to Sharon to to handle the questions. And again, I want to remind people if you have questions, to put them in the Q and A box, and we will answer those as um, as they're put into the box. So put your questions into the Q and A box. Yeah, at the moment, we don't have any. I'm guessing everybody was following along and now their questions are like, oh, wait, yeah, now I have a question about this, that, or the next thing. I really appreciated all of the, the talk about the plant um, choices in terms of the aesthetics. I think oftentimes in sustainability, it becomes somewhat utilitarian and we really focus on hardscape, water use, so um, 
I found that really interesting. Oh, thank you. Well, as I said, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a garden, not nature, not a landscape. So yeah. it does have to serve the needs of the humans who are living in it, too. And if you if you make it all about don't do this and don't do that and whatever, well, why bother? It's no fun. Then. <laughs> yeah. Do you find some of this a bit more difficult um, with native plants because they haven't necessarily been bred to produce the biggest flowers, the most flowers, the longest blooming um, I like a natural garden, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it for my own front yard and and thinking, wow, a lot of this isn't as showy, I think, as, as people are used to. Yes, that's absolutely the case. And as you said, native plants, for the most part, haven't been bred to be uh, balls of color you know, all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a different aesthetic and there's nothing wrong, nothing at all wrong with mixing natives and non-natives together. Um, I do encourage people to use a significant portion of natives in their yard uh, because they have so many benefits for the, the wildlife and such. But um, there's certainly no reason one has to, to grow nothing but natives. But all of the design um, uh, parameters, you know, uh, everything that I talked about can be used with native plants as well. They're just plants. It's just that you, you know, the colors you choose might be more subtle, they might be more fleeting, there might be fewer flowers. Um, one of the things people often worry about with, with natives is um, that it's going to be a messy garden. And um, that's, that has to do with maintenance. There are very particular tricks you can do to make uh, even a very casual garden read as maintained and cared for. One of the most important is neat edges. Always have a good edging on your border, even if what's inside is kind of wild and chaotic, that gives it that, it's a cue to care. It says this is a cared for garden. <laughs> well, that's then thank you. That's given us um, a, a minute two for questions to come in. Um, first question that's come in, somebody is wondering if you can suggest a book with the type of information that you've just covered for them to reference. Oh, heavens, lots of books. Um, I tell you what, why don't I email a list of several books after this rather than trying to pull one out of my head uh, without preparation, which probably might not be the best one, but there that are a idea. lot of excellent books um, on this sort of topic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can, and we've got some way that we'll post that later then. So okay, that's good. excellent. Um, <laughs> we've got a question. What ground covers do you recommend um, or warn against? <laughs> uh, first question is, are you wanting for sun or for shade? Uh, we don't have that. So, <laughs> just, um, so well, let me friends. just say something about ground covers in general then, because yeah. uh, this is a struggle I've had too, and that many people do have. Ground covers are supposed to cover the ground. So when you plant one and it starts to cover the ground and take over and crowd everything else out, remember, that's what you wanted it to do. So choose your ground cover carefully so that it, it's, you know, you can let it do that, let it do its job. And then if necessary, move more delicate things out of the way, you know, to have bigger things and lower ground covers. I've, I've been having to train myself to do that too, instead of saying, oh my God, it's spreading too much. I need to get rid of it. No, <laughs> that's what I planted it for. <laughs> All righty. Um, more specific um some questions coming in. In a shady native garden where you've got dug fir and big leaf maple and vine maples, what layering plants would you suggest for the ground? Well, you're pretty much stuck with what grows in nature for that and, and maybe plants that are similarly tough uh, that, that are not native here. Um, a dug fir forest is a very, very difficult ecosystem. And if you go into a dug fir forest, you will see sword ferns <laughs> and sword ferns and sword ferns and not a heck of a lot else. There will be some, some early spring ephemerals, but because it's an evergreen forest, you don't get that spring light that a deciduous forest has, which allows so many, many things to grow on the forest floor. Um, so it needs to be things that are very shade tolerant, a very drought tolerant because the trees are gonna take virtually all the moisture and you know, adapted to competing with the roots of big trees. Um, there, it's really, you just have to kind of experiment, but those are the characteristics you have to look for. 
Okay, thank you. Um, we've got, um, thanks for a wonderful learning experience. Are there plants better for screening out noise than others when you're dealing with street noise in an urban garden? Oh boy, um, I, I don't know off the top of my head of specific plants that might be better, but it's going to have to, it's going to have to do with density of the plant and the thickness of the planting layer. Um, you know, it, it's just simple physics, you know, the, the sound's going to travel through something that's thin and open. Um, and it's, I mean, you need a hell of a lot of greenery to really buffer tra a lot of traffic noise too. I, I might suggest that if you have traffic noise, um, it, it, buffering it that way is one thing, but also distracting from it, like having a nice water feature that's fairly loud and makes a much more pleasant sound can completely distract you from the background traffic noise. Oh, okay. Um, next question. We need shade for hot summer southwest exposure. How many trees are okay? I planted them too far from the front. I, I think she means from the front of the house. And the back deck I tried in containers, but the trees outgrew the barrels. Um, I think we've got a bunch of questions maybe. So uh, maybe... Um, well, it sounds like she wants yeah. to know how to how to get shade. Yeah, which obviously a lot of us are thinking about. Uh, you're never going to get enough shade from a tree in a container to shade a house to start with, and and this is a ge geometry problem. You mm -hmm. need to calculate um, how tall is the tree going to get in a reasonable number of years. How um, what angle is the sun at at the hottest time of the year when you want the shade? So it's pretty high in the sky in high summer, and it's probably going to be in the, the south and the west at the hottest part of the day when you, you want shade. So that's your key point. And then how far is the tree from the house? You know, the, the tree is a certain height and it's going to cast shade from wherever the sun is. If your house is way over here, it's not going to get the shade. So a tree needs to be pretty close to a house to cast shade on it. But the taller it is, the further away it can be. But that takes years. So I say it's, it's a geometry problem, but those are the things that you need to take into account. All righty, thank you. Let's see. Um, um, what type of native plants can be used in an area where it's shade in the winter, but mostly sunny in the summer? <laughs> Shade in the winter and sunny in the summer. Hmm. Well, probably ones that are dormant in the winter. <laughs> yeah. Well, one or the other, one or the other. You could do shade lovers that are evergreen through the winter, but that go dormant in a dry summer. Or you could use ones that grow more into the summer, assuming it gets some irrigation because a lot of native plants do go dormant in the summer because of lack of water. Um, it, you, you could use plants that are going to be dormant in the winter when it's shady and, and that want the sun later on. Um, there aren't going to be too many plants. I won't say none because there's probably some, but there aren't going to be too many that would like both of those conditions. Um, that's, uh, that would be going from cold temperatures in the winter and cool shade to hot temperatures and sun in the summer. So that's a pretty extreme um, gap there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just quickly answer this. Uh, someone is asking, the, the talk covered a lot of material. Will a recording of this talk be available afterward to review? And yes, these, these have been recorded and we post them on uh, the Master Gardener uh, YouTube page. So in a few days, you should be able to find this and watch it and take notes as you go. Um, <laughs> somebody's asking if you have any suggestions for blocking the neighbor's garbage can views. Sunny area of the side, front, and backyards. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if you want instant blockage, I would recommend a fence <laughs> or something of that sort, even a temporary fence. If you want to plant something, um, I mean, there are loads of plants that would love a sunny area and will grow relatively 
narrow, I'm assuming it's a fairly narrow area since that's usually what people are dealing with. Um, a lot of plants have been, rec have been bred in recent years to be relatively tall and skinny for just that sort of purpose. So, you know, as I don't want to say a specific plant because I don't know your site conditions, you need to look at your own site conditions. Is it full sun? Is it going to get irrigated? Um, do you want evergreen deciduous? Um, how tall does it need to be? You know, all of those different things and then go find plants that that will fit it. I say there are many, many, many plants that could do that, that sort of job. And of course, if you have a deeper area, you could do a hedgerow, you know, a mixed hedgerow or something, which would be very nice. Thank you. Um, we've got a question. I am interested in growing edible plants in a, in a way that is sustainable and supports native wildlife. Uh, again, it's a question about suggesting good books and resources. So could that be included in your list? And I, any I'm not sure that I know of any book on that topic specifically. If I come across one, I'll add it to the list. But um, so, so just two parts to that question, growing edibles sustainably. Um, the best, the most sustainable way is to do perennial edibles, you know, things that are not replanted every year because then you leave roots in the ground, you're not disturbing the soil. Um, uh, vegetable gardens are kind of a world unto themselves. You know, there's, there's no way you can't, uh, not you, you have to disturb the soil every year. So they, they're going to be always requiring maintenance and everything. But also if you want to have an edible garden and support wildlife, you're going to have to be willing to share, you know, <laughs> uh, let the wildlife have some of what you're growing too. Now, maybe some of what you'll grow will be food that's specifically for wildlife that you wouldn't eat. Um, and vice versa, but they'll still want to eat your stuff, of course. So um, I say I'm not I'm not really aware of a book on that topic, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. There's thousands of books out there that I don't know about. <laughs> so. well, thank you. Um, we've got a question about dealing with erosion. So when you've got a hillside, are there particular plants you'd recommend or things you'd think about in picking plants to prevent erosion? Well, you can actually find lists of plants that um, will help prevent erosion. You want um, plants that have a dense, fairly shallow root system for the most part. Well, not necessarily really shallow, but mainly a dense netted root system as opposed to a lot of long skinny roots, you know, so something that will knit the ground together. Um, something as simple as a ground cover can, it, can, it can work very well on a sunny hillside. You know, it's a native plant and it, it, it does a, a very good job of holding ground together. Um, the, the challenge can be um, getting plants started on a hillside so that they can hold it together. And um, uh, there's a, a planning technique where you, you dig out a little bit of a, a cup in the hillside so that you, you plant your plant in that, and then you, that will help catch water. You know, basically it's a little cup with, a, with it going up a little bit on the downhill side. Um, so that, that'll help get the plant started um, and mulch it in the short term to help keep, uh, at least minimize erosion until the plant roots can get started there. All righty, Th thank you. Um, we've got a question about uh, the link for the OSU Master Gardener YouTube channel. And I just want to mention to everybody that uh, Erica has posted that in the chat. So um, the link for the Master Gardener YouTube uh, channel is in the chat. Um, next question. We have azaleas were planted on the north side of my two-story house. I generally don't water these plants and they usually do okay with water stored in the soil. But some on the east now have died from lack of watering. Are there choices of azaleas that are more moisture tolerant? She probably means drought tolerant. Yes, um, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, the whole family of rhododendrons and azaleas generally do need summer irrigation in a special location like that, you know, in a relatively moist shaded location, a well established, you know, plant um, can go many years sometimes without water but this year, of course, has been unprecedented literally. 
in how dry and hot it's been. So even, I mean, even native plants, you know, you've all seen the flared out um, Douglas firs and everything, uh, red cedars, Western red cedars and all that have been fine for decades and decades. And now suddenly it's gotten to be too much for them. The same goes for the plants around our houses, things that you've never watered before. This is the year they needed water. And maybe in the future, you need to pay close attention and you may need to start watering them or plant something that's more drought tolerant. Uh, but as far as specifically azaleas that are more drought tolerant, um, not in general. Possibly the deciduous ones, just because they are deciduous, um, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. Actually, to that um, point, I have heard talk the last year or so about watering large, well-established trees. And how does one go about doing that? What's the recommended procedure for? Uh, you know, I, I'm really not sure. Um, okay. the, 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 big, the big issue is going to be if it's a big tree, you've got a big area of roots to water, you know, okay. because, and, and so I guess some things to remember are the roots aren't near the trunk. Let's say you've got a two foot diameter tree, you know, big old tree, and, and you can see it's getting a little stressed and you want to give it some help. Don't water it by the trunk. There aren't a bunch of feeder roots there. The feeder roots are at the drip line and further out beyond the drip line of the tree. So start your watering in a ring around the tree as much as you can, roughly at the drip line, and go out from there to some period, distance. And the other thing would be deep watering. Um, most, of, most of the tree's roots, uh, the feeder roots are in the top foot or so, just like with any other plants, but they also have deeper roots. And as with any other plant, if you can get the water deeper into the soil, it'll stay there longer. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of water, in other words, we're talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that um, is all the questions that we have received. And again, lots of comments thanking you for the information. And um, again, people interested in going back and studying the talk mm -hmm. now. So um, thank you very much. Um, anything else, any other announcements, uh, Julia? Yes. First, let me, let me thank you again. I think that was a very well struck con constructed lecture. I thought it was great. You covered all the bases. So I think a lot of people have some really good um, information now about how to go about designing their yard in a, in a more uh, methodical way. Um, before we go, I want to announce um, that the Lane County Master Garden Association is having for the next two Mondays, a uh, sustainable landscape series. And the link for you to sign up to it is in the chat. It was just put in the chat. They will be Mondays from six to eight, next Monday and the following Monday. And there will be talks about right plant, right place, composting, uh, such topics as that. So if you have an interest in that, please sign up for those. Um, they're free and available to anybody that signs up. Again, the link is in the chat. So thank you all very much for attending tonight. Thank you to our speaker. And uh, I want to wish you a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you.